Welcome, everybody, and also welcome to anybody who feels like the category of everybody doesn't adequately represent them. I'm Layman Pascal in an audaciously green shirt, and this is the first discussion in a mini-series that might generally be called the journey to cosmoerotic humanism. There's a lot to unpack around the notion of eros, a broad descriptor of the ways we participate in the wholeness of reality, and also the ways that such a concept might converge with developmental, spiritual, deeply pro-human ethics for the future of the individual and collective life on this planet at all scales. And there's especially a lot to unpack if we think this notion contains the seed of a widely applicable meta-meta theory, and I think that's being proposed. Yes. How yes. does this approach unfold? Where does it come from? What are the stages in the inception of this way of thinking? And ultimately, where does it end up? More colloquially, we might call this series, What the Hell Has Mark Gaffney Actually Been Working On? And today, we're going to discover some of the early concepts that feed into cosmoerotic humanism through the examination of a pair of texts called, respectively, Certainty and Uncertainty, I believe about to be republished in English, in which the exuberant Dr. Rabbi uses content from traditional Jewish wisdom teachings to propose what could be a useful, non-dual, developmental, humanistic, and theological framework for relating the experience of the determined to the experience of the undetermined. So if that's too weird or arcane for you, jump off now, because we're going <laughs> deep into existential and theological nuances. Hi, Mark. Did that sound hey, roughly true? Hey. Layman, first of all, that was fantastic. I have nothing to add. I resign, right? I'll just hand cosmorotic humans over to you, and I will get a green shirt, and we will be in good shape. But let me, before that happens, let me just say a couple of things. It was a fantastic framing, actually. It wasn't good. It was actually fantastic. And let me do a couple of things, share with you a moment, just a, a very sure. brief moment, maybe anecdotal before we head into the structures, which is there was a moment I was living in Portland and Zach Stein, who Zach's been studying with me since 2008, nine, and we started collaborating in the think tank, you know, somewhere in 2012 or 13. And Zach is a, a you know, a key partner, you know, and co-creator with me in cosmorotic humanism. And there was a moment Barbara Marks Hubbard was there. It was actually not long before she passed. So she was at my, my home in Portland and Christina Kincaid was there, who's a co-author on Return to Eros and Zach was there. And I had this, this kind of this thing, just, you know, this, this movement of Eros just moved through me. And I said, everyone, we got to stop what we're doing. Let's go downstairs and sit in the apartment and just think. So we, we all go downstairs and we, we kind of felt it because we had been talking and looking for the name of this meta theory of meta theories that would integrate and actually begin to, to generate a, a universal grammar of value as a context for our diversity in response to the meta crisis. So we go downstairs and we say, okay, what's the name of it? And I had called in a, these two volumes called Radical Kabbalah, which I wrote in Oxford, which we'll get to. I had a term there, a cosmic humanism. Ken had actually suggested to me when he read them, he read the, the, the like first 1500 pages when they first came out and he kind of read them and marked them all up and passed them around Boulder. Ken wrote me and said, maybe you should call it non-dual humanism, right? And so we, we went back and forth to non-dual humanism, but actually in return to Eros, I had talked a lot about the cosmoerotic universe. And all of a sudden it just hit us. And I said, cosmoerotic humanism. And Zach at the same time said, cosmoerotic humanism. And Barbara said, cosmoerotic humanism. And it was this, and Christina, it was really a magical moment in which, and in that moment, literally all of the strands of thought from the last 20 years of thinking literally kind of configured themselves into this vision of cosmoerotic humanism. And including in those strands is Zach's developmental strands, you know, Barbara's, you know, evolutionary strands you know, kind of a, an, you know, the kind of old notions of conscious evolution. So development, conscious evolution, right. And, and, you know, everything I'd been working on in, you know, in terms of eros and uniqueness and my visions of development and evolution all came together. And it was just a beautiful moment. It was an inception moment. And you literally, brother, you could feel the heavens opening, right. It was just a wonderful moment. And we're right now, just to share with you, we're right now, literally without hyperbole, we have essentially now about 15 unpublished volumes, right? That we're kind of working and crafting. And after dialoguing with you and, you know, besides your green shirt, if I can give you a compliment, I know it's too early in the day for that, but you, you really thought through carefully in our dialogue on world spirituality, the issues, which was unusual and impressive. So I just want to bow to that. And so when, when we came up with this idea of it's really, really critical to integrate the seven or eight books before 
you know, cosmoronic humanism into the discussion, you know, that I've written. And I hope at the end of this series, you'll also do a dialogue with Zach on his book, Education in a Time Between Worlds, which also needs to be integrated because that's also part of the story. And Barbara, you know, sadly won't be able to appear, but, you know, she'll be with us in spirit. So it's very, very exciting to actually be able to integrate this material simply because this material is, you know, these seven or eight books are the core of the interior sciences. And we're not going to succeed in articulating universal grammar of value that has any seriousness, that's scalable, that can respond to the meta crisis, that's a context for our diversity, if we don't integrate the depth of the interior sciences. And what I was trying to do, and then back to you, what I was trying to do in the interior sciences was not develop a meta theory. I, I never had any intention, I said to Ken the other day, of developing a meta theory of meta theories. I was trying to solve problems, right? In other words, wow, the way the traditions are being understood in terms of certainty or uncertainty, no, that's that's completely askew. Let me see if I can uncover uncover over 10 years a complete other strain. Oh, the way we understand, you know, identity just as true self, that's a huge mistake. Oh, the way we're we're talking about life energy and kind of disqualifying eros. So I went to solve individual problems in the laboratory, right, of ideas in the laboratory of life, in the laboratory of what does it mean to live, right, a whole life. And what happened is as we as we solved each problem. But they were solved not with cheap grace. I mean, literally this stuff we're about to talk about, I locked myself in, in a room for six months in Jerusalem, literally. And for six months, all I did was read every theodicy in the world, right? Everything I could find written in every tradition on evil, right? And just realized it doesn't get there. And it was, and it, I literally was burning in me that if we can't actually address uncertainty and certainty, right, I can't stay in the game. And so I spent literally six months a day and night doing nothing else but just dreaming, thinking about this until a set of realizations emerged. So I just want to share that we're, we're not in the realm of kind of meta-theoretical ideas. This is not surface armchair philosophy. Our lives are at stake here. Our ability to articulate a grammar of value in response to the meta-crisis, I think, is, is the only way we can either make it through the meta-crisis or know where we are the day after. So just, just by way of introduction, hello, it's great to see you, and I love the shirt. Hi. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a fan of emergent titles, so that sounds good. I like that you started with an anecdote, because I was going to start something similar there with my first question, because at the beginning of the book, Certainty, there's a little bit of a discussion around the idea that the adventure of spiritual understanding, the path of understanding, has to be... Uh, grounded and refounded in the vital personal experience of one's own life, that the lessons of encoded wisdom texts are real in the degree to which they rise from and inform and integrate with our own stories. Yes. So where else all of this is, it's also the Torah of Mark's life. And I was curious if you would share something about where you were in your life and what you were going through that made you want to take seriously the questions of certainty and uncertainty? Like, yeah. why was this a significant question for you? And what did your unfolding contemplation of these topics help you to do or to be in your own life, your own embodiment, your own instantiated being? What was the interplay between those levels? That's beautiful. That's, that's a beautiful question. It's, it's one of the many reasons you're beautiful. And it's actually funny, right? As, even as I said that sentence, you know, one of the things we're not allowed to do in the public discourse is we're not allowed to be excited about each other. We have to be very, otherwise we somehow lose credibility. So first thing I want to say is fuck that. Right? <laughs> we get to be excited about each other. We get to be excited. That's like a really beautiful question. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited by it. So, so let me try and respond to it. My I grew up on a set of stories, Layman, that were my mother's kind of, you know, my mother's milk. You know, it was the stories that defined my mother, right, who was in the kingdom of the night, you know, was in the Holocaust. And, you know, her defining story, which is, I won't tell you the whole story, but the end of the story has her up in a tree. She was a hidden child, hidden by a beautiful Christian family in Poland, a righteous family. Right. She was then in 1944, you know, the one of the neighbors informed on her that this was actually a Jid, right? A Jewish child. Right. The Gestapo came, she hid, people killed, and she's up in a tree. And the Gestapo, this is my mother talking, right? And actually in the um the Steven Spielberg archives, they interviewed her, and this has been been documented. 
right? You know, tragically, she sees a, the Gestapo take a baby and, and rip the baby apart, right? So I heard that story thousands of times, not once, not twice, right? That was, that story was followed by my mother, and, you know, and her mother being buried alive, you know, at age four. And there's a, a dialogue on my website with Byron Katie, when Byron and I talked about this and Byron, you know, made the argument that, you know, there is no, it's just how we experience it. And I said, Byron, it's not just how we experience it. And actually there's, there's objective suffering. And it, we had a whole, you know, profound conversation on this. And, and the third experience was my mother was in, in front of a firing squad, you know, at age five. So how do you hold, right? Any sense of the certainty of the reality's goodness, right? In the face of unbearable suffering, you know, on the one hand. On the other hand, my own direct experience of life, right? Was both of intense pain at the suffering, but at the same time, an almost ecstatic delight, right? At just the utter joy of being alive, right? And, and one of the, I, I wish I could claim it. If I had a way to go to claim it, I would, but I don't have a way to do it with any intelligence, but just one of the gifts, you know, she gave me, and by she, I mean reality, is I'm, I'm madly delighted to be alive, right? I'm, I'm madly delighted by the the sensual experience of air and talking and your green shirt and, and the interchange. And, and so I have, I have a kind of direct daily experience, which is not Pollyannish and it's not bypassing, but it also is profound and lives with me. You know, it's just the very goodness of it all, you know, Aquinas's favorite verse, right. In the, uh, in the old Testament, as he called it was Tamu Uru Kitova Donai, right. Taste and see that God is good. So I also have a direct experience of that goodness, and I didn't know how to put those together. I didn't know how to put those together. So it really came out of, and you you intuited, and that's why I said beautiful, you intuited, right, that this, this kind of deep dive into kind of creating a new structure of value and a relationship between certainty and uncertainty could only have come, right, from an intense, you know, heart-rending personal contradiction which I needed to turn into a paradox in order not only to teach anything, but in order to live. So, so something like that, friend. I want to ask something about the, the uncertainty of the other. And I guess what I mean is, I know there are ancient wisdom teachings that remind tribal people to not assume they know who the other is. There's an interesting Greek concept I like of hilaritas, which is to look for this good humored glint in the eye by which you could detect a God because the gods are shapeshifters and you can't necessarily tell who's who. And likewise, there's the Christian parable of the Samaritan. Um, So the person who's your ally might not really be someone from your family or nation or faith community. You can't always tell who's who and what that means for you. So how does your pondering of the interrelations between certainty and uncertainty arrive at an ethic of the other as a way of holding open the nature of the other rather than foreclosing it? Well, let let me, it's a beautiful question. Let me go one step back. Okay. Let me, let me kind of step back for a second before we step forward. So at the core, if I had to summarize, you know, the entire book on certainty, you know, which, which we're also rewriting somewhat now, but the entire book on certainty is the realization that certainty doesn't mean that it is true. Certainty means that I am true. So there's a, and that's a critical move. So we move from kind of a pre-modern dogmatic certainty that it is true, right? And there's a set of it's that are true, right? To a post-postmodern, right? Realization of the core certainty of being that I experience as my actual interior experience, aka that I am true, right? But that I am true, right? In the sense that I am intrinsically valuable, right? Worthy, right? I am, I am true. So from that perspective, I begin with this experience of I am true, which is, as we discuss in the book, and I don't know if we'll get to it and you're guiding our dialogue, but that's actually the experience that births messianic consciousness into the world. You know, maybe we'll talk about it later. It's the Judah experience. And I don't want to 
I don't want to jump into that right now, but Judah's experience, which births Judah as the antecedent and the lineage to David, who's the father of Solomon, right? Who's the antecedent, right? To the kind of the Jesus story, who's the antecedent to messianic consciousness. So this notion of a new human, a new possible experience of being a human being, right? Which stems from this Judah moment is when Judah actually has an experience together with his mother, Leah, in this biblical archetypal story, right, that he is true, that he is intrinsically worthy and valuable. So from that place, right, from that place of actually experiencing that I am true, I now have the possibility to open up to the truth that you are true. Until I know that I am true, my relationship to you is parasitic. Right? And as I'm using you in some instrumental way right, to validate right, the void that lives in the very depth of my being, which is unbearable, it's a void that you know, is an experience of, of intense, it's the experience of the whole in the universe, right? H-O-L-E, this, this essential experience of the whole in the universe that we do everything to avoid, we avoid dance, right? We dance around that void. And then we, we seek every form of what we call in cosmonautic humanism, pseudo eros, right? To cover up the void, which is the failure of eros. And eros is the experience that I am true. So until I have that experience, and right, until I am in the utter truth of laymanness, then every relationship I have, right, is ultimately instrumental, you know, parasitic, right? And I can't actually be in devotion to it. And I can't be right filled with the wonder and beauty and radical amazement at who you are because I'm not true. But the second I am true, right? And, and you can, by the way, see here this notion of Judah and Judah's experience of I am true in the first chapter of the certainty book was the first seed of a book that became soul prints, which is where he first coined the term unique self, which later became the seed of of unique self theory, but it, be, it began with this notion of Judah and the way Judah's understood in the esoteric lineages is that Judah is not generic. This is very important. Judah is not, it's not a generic experience of I am true. Judah is actually irreducibly unique. Judah is experiencing not true self, if you will, right? And it's not, I'm participating in the field of consciousness. Judah is experiencing a Judahness right? Judah is experiencing reality having a Judah experience, if you will, right? And it's from that irreducible uniqueness where he finds that uniqueness in the eyes of his mother, Leah, for the first time. And his mother has had three children before, all of whom she named in instrumental ways, right? Leah steals Jacob, as it were, from her sister, Rachel, right? Marries Jacob in the darkness. Jacob of course, never loves her. She, she yearns to be Mrs. Jacob with all her heart and soul. She has three children, Reuven, Shimon, and Levi. And each of these children, she names some instrumental name. So it's exactly your question. And she can't even love her child. There's no other even in her child. Reuven is Ra'adonai God saw my affliction. Shimon is Shamadonai Tisnoanochi, God heard I was hated. <laughs> Can you imagine, hey, God heard, God heard I was hated. Are you playing out there with uh, God saw my affliction? And the third son is called Levi, as in Levi's genes, Levi. Maybe now my husband will take walks with me. So, so you intuitively picked up on the exact core. She can't even have a relationship in which she sees the child as an other because she doesn't have an experience of her own core certainty of being. And it's only when she breaks that pattern of these three children and she has her fourth child, where she's able to reverse to, to, to kind of uncoil that contraction. And she actually is in her layness. And she has this fourth child, Judah. And she looks down at Judah and she says, Hapam odet Adonai, this time I'm in the divine presence. And, and Judah is no, and that's the, that's the name Judah. This time I'm in the divine presence. This is the first name that's non instrumental. This is the first name that's non I it. Right? This is the first name in which. There's an actual lived experience of my own core certainty of being, not it is true, I am true. For the first time, she can actually relate to Judah. She can actually hold Judah. And Judah actually has the experience of being non-instrumental. And that experience is in Western, the Western canon, 
This is the most significant moment, literally, in the Western canon. When you read Hermetic literature, you read Christian Islamic literature, it all goes back to this exact moment in chapter 29 in Genesis, where Leah reverses the pattern of her trauma. It's the first time in the book of Genesis, which is a source code text of Western civilization, where someone has a traumatic experience and then they disinhibit the trauma and change the pattern. That's what Leah does. She has a pattern, one child, two children, three children. Each of those children are instrumental. She never is able to experience herself in her core certainty of being. Then she has Judah. She says, ah, Judah, this time I experienced myself in the divine presence. She holds Judah in her arms and Messiah is born. That's messianic consciousness. That's the experience of actually being in my own core certainty of being. And so Judah becomes the beginning of I thou, all of I thou, right? All of that experience in which I can actually experience the irreducible truth of the other who's non-instrumental, who has their own perspective and their own quality of intimacy to whom I can be in devotion, right? Is born in this moment. So that's a beautiful, a beautiful way in. And, and I think absolutely correct. There is no other unless I am true. Wow. Yeah, that's really interesting. That uh, I like this idea of, I mean, relationship isn't possible really until you're true. And then it's possible to encounter the other as both another true and as a mystery. And, and as a mystery, right? Because I don't need, and this comes to certainty and uncertainty again, right? In other words, it, that, that again, I mean, you're, you're batting three out of three. You can only go downhill now, right? But the last sentence you said was, was, was crucial. Right. And as I can encounter the other as a mystery. So, what do we mean by that? What we mean by that is when I experience my own certainty of being, and here again, notice we're reclaiming certainty. I can't tell you the amount of conversations I've had with people who kind of hold this position of we're postmodern uncertainty, and any notion of certainty is dogmatically rejected. But that's a mistake. It's a category mistake. We reject the myth of the given, right? as we reject the myth of the framework, right? But, but the myth of the given is, right? I have a direct access to reality, right? There's no mediating prisms and I'm making this dogmatic claim that it is true. Now that we should appropriately reject, but actually the experience of I am true, right? Is actually Newman and not phenomena. It's a direct experience of my truth. And once I have a direct experience of, of my truth, then I'm able to hold your mystery because once I have a legitimate, authentic experience of certainty, I don't need to resolve mysteries to resolve uncertainties inappropriately, which is actually a pseudo-erotic strategy, right, to provide myself with pseudo-certainties. So for example, so often, and names shall not be mentioned, but two or three of my friends who are, you know, wonderful and brilliant, you know, kind of teachers and the, the popular kind of, um, transformation space, not the, the kind of spirit space, who get, you know, 10,000 people at these kind of huge events. And they're very, very brilliant when they talk to someone at kind of honing in and explaining that person to themselves. Right? And they're often half accurate, but they're also half not accurate. But this movement to actually be certain about the other, right, to kind of fit the other into kind of a, a category, you're, you're an Enneagram type this, and you've got this pathology. And if you did this, and you write, that actually, that actually is a violation of devotion, right? Yes, we need to explain what we can explain, but you're also a mystery. And I'm willing to love you so much that I can hold your mystery. And we can deepen in that mystery together. And I can hold the uncertainty of your being. And I don't need to reduce you to a certainty to place you in a box. And we do that so often with people. We place people in a box and they're not allowed to transform. They're not allowed to change. They're not allowed to grow, that they actually violate evolution, which is a series of transformations. We freeze frame them because we desperately need to, because our categorization of them in a particular way gives us the pseudo certainty, which replaces the, the dramatic failure of Eros in our own interior, which is our own Judah experience of I am true. So like that. Yeah. I think this is a really important issue in terms of it being an, an inhibition to the development of more integral and meta-modern consciousness in the world, because there are a lot of people uh, opening up to the feelings and the sensitivity and the cognitive complexity that we would associate with these second tier developmental stages. Uh, 
And when they go to look for wisdom, when they go to look for spirituality, when they go to look for practice and insight, they very often encounter interesting, charismatic people who want to over insist, be too certain about them, be too certain. Right. And it turns them right. off about certainty and it turns them off about spirituality. And it right. ends up creating a problem in post-modernity. It traps them in post-modernity. And that Absolutely. trap doesn't have to occur. That's right. No, that's exactly right. And you know, and and teachers have to be very, very careful. You know, there's a there's a capacity that some of us have, which is a gift, to actually see something that's important in the structure and psyche of a person and to share that with them. But we have to share that with a radical, radical epistemic humility, right? And, and with a sense of devotion. Right. And and I think I want to just I mean, maybe if I can, with your permission, I want to introduce, you know, three words here, maybe three, four words that 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 we forget in. In, in you know, in spiritual teaching, in in philosophizing, you know, and 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 it has to be the center of a world philosophy. You know, Zach and I, and the gang, you know, the the board, we just renamed our center from Center for Noble Wisdom to the Center for World Philosophy and Religion, as a you know as a you know which transcends and includes you know the the inner world model, which is so so important and so vital. But in world philosophy, there, there's a couple of words that that often got get left out of conversations. So the words are sincerity, sincerity, like devotion, reverence, right? I mean, these are very, they're such important words, right? And we, we don't trust sincerity because we don't trust it in ourselves. And we, we have to hold each other in reverence, right? And we have to be devoted to each other, right? And it's got to be a lived experience. In other words, and, and again, if, with permission. So when I just got on the phone with you, I was excited to see you. I was like, oh, here's Lehman, right? And who's got his whole world and his whole, you know, wondrous mind playing in the places that he plays with, with his green shirt, which we'll, we won't refer to again, right? But in other words, it's like, and so there has to be immediately in me, right? To be the new human, to actually emerge in, in the kind of world we need to create, this new narrative of identity. What, what has to immediately be triggered in me in the best sense of triggered when I see you face to face is curiosity, devotion, reverence, sincerity. That I want to have a sincere conversation. Lionel Trilling used to talk about sincerity. It's like, you know, and, and often, you know, when you look at the kind of Michael Commons, you know, kind of hierarchical complexity and, and lots of the integral models adaption of it, right? Or, you know, the kind of, the kind of, you know, you know, and Zach is more familiar with that than I am with metamodern literature. I haven't really tracked it, but I've I've seen a couple of things. You know, there's kind of a a lack of epistemic humility and devotion, right? Love, eros, right? We got to love each other. Let's start there. At love as a value because we're so we're so in our own core certainty of being, which is the exact opposite of narcissism. Narcissism means we have no core certainty of being, and so there's a pseudo erotic narcissism which covers it up. But actually, I can once I can relax in myself and my core certainty of being, then I can be devoted to you. I can be reverent, right, of you. And we need to reintroduce sincerity and, and reverence and, and devotion and curiosity. You know, Rorty, you know, I love Rorty, but Rorty has, um, you know, a, a few short, stunning paragraphs on curiosity. You know, and I say it a little differently than he does, but, but he was in this conversation. There's no love without curiosity. And curiosity is about uncertainty. It's about the willingness to hold the mystery of you, right? The esoteric of you. You know, the, the word esoteric goes through a number of languages, you know, but it's originally sourced in Hebrew, which is the word seter. And seter, right, means hidden, secret. It also means destruction because it's a contronym. You know, it's one of those contronyms where a word in its opposite. And so, if I'm not willing to hold the esoteric in you, mystery is from esoteric. It's the same, you know, original cognate root. If I can't hold it, I'm not in devotion to your mystery. I've already destroyed you, right? And it, I, I've already not allowed you to potentiate. And so this, this reclaiming of certainty, the certainty that I am true, and that certainty is utterly destroyed by kind of a postmodern deconstruction of value. Because the experience of I am true is not possible 
unless I'm in what I call the field of value. The second I step out of the field of value, and the way I would interpret Lehman for lots of reasons, I won't go into the footnotes now, but the way I would interpret the eternal Tao, the eternal Tao is the field of value, if I can borrow that term. I'm in the field of value. As long as I'm in the field of value, I can be reverent. Reverence, there is no reverence outside of the field of value, right? So, so if Lehman is just a, a random, strange social construction born on a particular island where he saw green, and so therefore he reenacts it and, and he's kind of replaying the traumas again and again and trying to work out those early attachment disorders, you know, and, and he's still humiliated getting his basic needs met and, and we've read some Balbi and we've read some, you know, Kohat and let's throw in a little Winnicott, right? And that's all, it, right? He's just this strange, confused, random, you know, social construction, right? That death ends the story and it's this kind of fleeting, you know, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, right? Creeps in its petty pace day after day to the last syllable of reported time. It's a tale told by an idiot full of signs and furies signifying nothing. There's no reverence. So it's only when layman is an instantiation, the field of value. And that's what unique self is. Layman is in the field of value. But there's a value called layman that never was never will be ever again. And I'm radically curious. What's he thinking? What excites him? Right? What, what arouses his heart? What can I learn from him? Right? Right? What, what does he have to tell me? Right? And without that, there's no ethos because all ethos is rooted in that eros, which is ultimately rooted in the experience of I am true. So that's just uh, some words on certainty. Just so, so wonderful to be talking to you about this. Um, these underappreciated words, uh, reverence, sincerity, um, I'd like to add to them a different kind of underappreciated word, which is steams. You know, uh, there's way it again. Way Trungpa used seams. Trungpa was really good at conveying with his being access to the field of value, but with his words being very cautious and very open in a way that a lot of people aren't. And I think one of the things we need to do is uh, tease apart access to the field of value from absolutistic statements that historically have been used to try to denote the field of value. I have a lot of discussions around what we call the metaphysics of adjacency, where you go, well, you know, what you meant by 100%, we think 99% means, or it doesn't have to be absolutely totalized in order to get the effect you think you wanted. But one of the reasons it seems like people reach for excessive pseudo certainty and totalization is something in their character armoring, something in their physiology, something in the way energy is used in their organism. Uh, how much, how much of a role do you think just basic physiology plays in a person's ability to access value without trying to choke it with certainty? That's, that's, that's beautiful. So, so a couple of things here, there's, there's three or four, we need to unpack this slowly. So one, Right, the book of Job, chapter 19, through my body I vision God. Right. And so the the experience and Reich intuited this. He didn't get it all right, but he was he was making mistakes in the right direction. And you know, sadly, people like Alexander Lowe and his students, you know, went kind of postmodern with it. And his other student, actually, John Pericos, right, actually didn't make the postmodern move and actually made a more grounded and important move in core energetics. But but Reich got the sense, he didn't know how to formulate it. He didn't know how to express it, right? The sense of, of embodiment itself being critical to my experience of my core certainty of being, which is why, you know, attachment theory is actually saying something so important. It's saying the, the physical experience of being touched, right? And held, right? And the experience of having my basic needs addressed, which are the need for touch and the need for nourishment, that that actual embodied physical experience, essentially from Balbi to Mary, you know, Ainsworth, right, to, you know, Kohat, right, to Winnicott, to Harry Stack Sullivan, right, this entire world, which is enormously important to me on many, many levels, right, what they're basically saying is, right, is that, oh, this early experience of embodiment, right, is essential, and you can actually appropriately understand all of this as a commentary to the experience of Judah, 
And actually, the Judah story in which Judah is held in the arms of his mother and experiences non-instrumental love is actually, in some sense, a proto-attachment theory story, right, from several thousand years ago. And actually, I had the, the delight of speaking um, a year, a year and a half ago at a, a, a key attachment theory conference and sharing with, you know, 50 people at this kind of, in this group of leading, you know, brilliant people in this field, right, this Judah model which is very, very exciting for all of us because this Judah model really is about this the sense of needing the embodied feeling of nourishment and touch in order to access my core certainty of being. So that's a, that's the embodiment is, is hugely, hugely important. So that's a, that's a good place to start. Now, th there was a second thing you said I want to pick up on. So embodiment, hold on. What was I just, I lost a thread. You know, my age, you know, layman. So let me just pick up that thread. Hold on one second. A little told that there. Let me let me turn it back to you. Let me turn it back to you. I think that that's enough on embodiment. Yeah, that might be all right on embodiment. There's another serious issue here, and you touched on it a little bit around the issues that drove you to this inquiry. And that's the question of evil. And in the classic form, some of the classic forms of religious presentation, there's this argument that the true and the good way is already known, and that confusion around the established norms leads to corruption, which bursts out as individual and collective evil. But there's also arguments that philosophers like Nassim Taleb, say, would make, informed by chaos and collective uh, computational irreducibility, complex dynamics, all that kind of stuff, saying certainty around the models leads to outbursts of evil and we have to be much more comfortable with not knowing so you know the big question here with a thousand caveats is what produces evil certainty or uncertainty this is and here we've got it this is now we're at the crux of things okay and let's see if we can take this in a few steps because mm -hmm. this is wildly important to respond to the meta crisis it's wildly important to be a new human and new humanity it's wildly important for any notion of, of ethics and any notion of eros. I mean, everything, everything depends on this. So let, let's go a few steps. So step one, let's maybe move to uncertainty for a second, right? To be able to kind of set the frame. So uncertainty operates at a number of different levels, right? Uncertainty is not a, a whole cloth. Right? There are different structure stages of consciousness and uncertainty operates and appears differently at each structure stage of consciousness, as does certainty, right? So the experience of certainty, the experience that I am true at lower structure stages of consciousness can be easily hijacked into ethnocentric, my nation is true, for example, right? Or, you know, some particular dogmatic truth, right? To actually get to the notion that I am true, right, is actually a very very sophisticated and beautiful level of depth consciousness that is actually available at the healthy level of all of the structure stages of consciousness, but, but at the pathological level, you won't actually get to I am true. So first, we just have to note that, that this experience of certainty is mediated always through developmental consciousness, number one. Now, when we turn to cert uncertainty, this becomes you know, even more important. In other words, level one, I don't know. I don't know. Level two, I know. I know. Level three, I don't know. And there, there's a very beautiful story about the uh, Baal Shem Tov, right? The master of the good name who, you know, emerges out of the Carpathian Mountain, 1760 around. And he, he, he founds this Hasidic movement about which Martin Buber and so many others wrote so much. And he sends Jacob Joseph of Polnoy, right? His earliest student to find a match for his daughter. And... He tells him, go to this village and this place, and you'll encounter that man, and, and that's the one, and, he, and please interview him. And so Jacob Joseph, who's also in his own right a major master, goes and he asks him questions in, in Bible, and he says, I don't know. And he asks him questions in Talmud, and he says, I don't know. And he asks him questions in Zohar, and he says, I don't know. And Jacob Joseph is, of course, you know, filled with consternation. The Baal Shem Tov clearly made a mistake here. He goes back and travels back, and he says, I found that young man. And the Baal Shem Tov says, so did you interview him? Did you ask him the questions? And he says, yeah. And he says, could you tell me what he said? It's why? He doesn't really want to share it. So no, tell me, tell me. And then he relates the interview. 
And he says, well, I asked him about this. And he said, I don't know. And the Baal Shem Tov says, Gewalt, wonderful. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, in other words, and he gets more and more ecstatic about after he hears each I don't know. Right? And of course, the point is there's a cloud of unknowing right? as, as Christ consciousness held it. Right? There, there's a notion of holding the mystery and acting the architonics of Luriana Kabbalah the highest level in what's called Ak, Adam Kadmon, the primordial human being, the highest level is called Radla in Aramaic, Reish Delo Yada Belot Yada. It's the uncertainty about the configuration of lights, right? And lights meanings kind of inner structures, right? Of consciousness that actually define reality. And so there's this argument between two interpreters of Luria. Is this uncertainty epistemological? I mean, in the end, we're going to know. There's just, we don't know yet, or is it ontological? And the actual deeper reading, it's ontological. It's ultimate uncertainty. In other words, the highest configuration of light, right, in this primordial human being, in this architonic structure, right, of the interior sciences is the experience of uncertainty. So this is not uncertainty, which is methodological, right? This is a kind of ontological pluralism, if you will. But this is not a, not a methodological pluralism. It's not an epistemological pluralism. Let's introduce this notion of an ontological pluralism in which uncertainty is fundamental and core and irreducible. And, it, and that's critical. So there, there's a notion of uncertainty, which is irreducible. And it's actually in the actual experience of uncertainty itself that I actually am able right, to realize the full depth of my being because that uncertainty is not in contradiction to my certainty. That uncertainty is in paradoxical, dialectical, dancing relationship, right, with my uncertainty. And so this dialectical dance between certainty and uncertainty, when I actually published these two works in, in Israel, Lehman, right, they were actually two volumes, and one was titled Vadai, Certainty, and the other was titled Safek, Uncertainty, and they were in, you know, two bound volumes next to each other. And the point was, you can't have one without the other. We have to redefine certainty from it is true to I am true, but then we need to reclaim uncertainty as an essential spiritual value, right? Without which spirit dies, you know, as an arc, part of the archetonic structure of the world. So now where does evil come from? So evil comes from two places, actually. It, it comes from pathological versions of certainty, right? And pathological versions of uncertainty, right? In other words, when I claim uncertainty, right, but in a way that is actually pseudo eros, I'm not willing, right, when I claim, excuse, excuse me, when I claim certainty as a form of pseudo eros, and I'm unwilling to hold the uncertainty, so that false certainty generates evil, without question. On the other hand, when I refuse to claim the core certainty of my being and your being, Right? I refuse to step into that irreducible certainty. And, and I actually remain in this kind of ambiguity about value. I refuse to claim the irreducible nature of ontological value. And even if we argue about what the nat how value expresses itself, we've already stepped into the field of value. And so if we step into the field of value, we're already in the field of certainty. Then it's already just an argument about how we understand value. But if we don't step into the field of value, we're not in the field of certainty in any sense, shape, or form, then human beings become numbers, right? And then human beings become objects, first-class objects on the web, as Nardella and Microsoft framed it, right? And, and we become essentially subjects of what Zach and I call techno-feudalism, right? To be manipulated by kind of an emergent techno-utopia in which the entire world is recreated as a kind of Skinner's Walden too, right? Enacted, you know, on a global scale because there's no core certainty of being. There's no sense of the irreducible value of layman. And so in order to actually get to ethos, I need to actually be always dancing between the core certainty of my being, which then gives me the capacity to hold epistemic uncertainty about anything that doesn't deserve to be foreclosed. And, and basically, if you kind of think about this, we can think about this together for a second. Pre-modernity claimed dogmatic certainty, but hijacked that certainty to ethnocentric and dogmatic surface structure contexts, right? It is true. 
modernity comes along, shatters all of those idols of certainty, but then claims without actually validating it, a whole new set of certainties about progress, you know, about human rights, about, you know, the individual, but it just, it just declares those certainties, doesn't actually validate them in experience. They're kind of self-evident. These are common sense. I call them with Zach, common sense, sacred axioms of value. But when David Hume talks about them, he doesn't, doesn't really believe they're true, but we kind of, we hold them that way, as Rousseau says, right? We hold them as kind of these, the part of our civil religion, Rousseau's phrase, but, but they don't actually believe they're true. There's very few people like Comenius, we actually hold them as, as genuine truths. So, so modernity claims certainties, but doesn't have a lived experience of them. It doesn't have a realization of them. So post-modernity comes along and basically calls the bluff of modernity, right? And says, modernity, you guys are borrowing social capital from pre-modernity, right? We're, we're actually going to call your bluff. That's, that's social capital. That's crypto, right? That's crypto, crypto money from pre-modernity that you're using. That actually the center doesn't hold. We're calling your bluff and, and the whole the center doesn't hold. Right? It all collapses and there's no more reverence and there's no more sincerity and there's no more curiosity because there's no sense of the irreducible certainty of your value, which generates reverence. So we need core certainty, a value, not of a particular value and a particular expression, but that we're in the field of value. I mean, I could say it for you this way, brother. So let's, let's take the pro-life, pro-choice thing for a second. Okay, you got these two conflicting values around this abortion debate. But- it only polarizes when you've stepped out of the Tao. <laughs> Meaning, if you've basically stepped out of the field of value, so then instead of really standing for a value, let's say pro-choice, no, that value becomes not value, it becomes a source of identity. My identity is right this particular position. So the pro-life, you know, liberal postmodern folks, right, who are kind of excuse me, who are pro-choice, choice becomes a form of identity. But the fundamentalists who adopt dogmatic pro-life positions, they're also not in the field of value. They're actually understanding my particular position, my particular church, right, is the dogmatic truth. They've both stepped out of the field of value. And a way to understand it is, if you want to understand this in terms of the unique self model, you can say the field of value is true self. And true self is the field of consciousness. It's the field of value. The particular value, choice life, that's unique self. That's the unique discretion of the field. Right. But that's very beautiful. So in other words, underneath life is value and underneath choice is value. So in other words, if we're both in the field of value, then already what unites us is far greater than what divides us, that which divides us because we're actually joined in the field of value. And therefore, we don't polarize. We move to paradox. Right. Because when I'm in the field of value, I can hold paradox. But if I'm not in the field of value, if I'm actually claiming a value, but as a form of identity, but I've actually, in my own experience, stepped out of the Tao, and I, I'm not in the field of value, then actually, I've actually turned my value not into unique self, my values become actually separate self, right? And as I haven't actually entered the field of value, so the particular value I'm espousing is kind of a separate self, it's kind of an egoic claim. And if it's an egoic claim, then we're in Hobbes' state of war, and we're going to fucking kill each other, because it's the values are two separate selves clashing, so I need to move beyond the separate self experience of value, where each value is a separate self. I need to step into true self, the field of value. And from there, we can move from polarization to paradox because we're in the field of value. So the field of value itself is one of the sources of the core certainty of being, right? And as I'm not just lame in a social construction, right? I'm actually, I'm an irreducibly unique expression of the field of value. From that place, I can hold uncertainty. And I can hold epistemic uncertainty about other people, about ideas, right? About other perspectives, about other qualities of intimacy. So the only way we get to ethos, right, is to actually reformulate the essential relationship between certainty and uncertainty. And we have to do that, A, by redefining certainty, and B, by reclaiming uncertainty, but not at a kind of level one, I don't know because I haven't done the work. No, no, no. I've actually moved from I don't know to I know. Right. I don't know pre tragic. Right. I don't know. I just, I'm going to live in my life. I know. I know. Right. Oh, God. Right. I know. I know all of the stuff, all of the complexity. Right. Tragic. Then I got to go to post tragic where I kind of reclaim uncertainty, but my certainty and uncertainty dance together like that. So that's a wonderful and it's critical. You, you literally can't have a conversation without this. Right? The confusion around certainty and uncertainty is so fundamental. Right. And, and literally, you have all the people who stand. You know, I, I have a friend of mine said, 
a, a quite well-known teacher in Hebraic context, you know, he said to me proudly, I remember 20 years ago, he says, Mark, I only teach my uncertainties. I said, wow, what an egregious violation of your students. He said, I credit, he was like, he said, because I said, whatever his name was, I said, clearly you're doing this because you're filled with certainties. And you chose this not because of good funding. You chose this because you're filled with a passionate set of implicit certainties. And you don't share those with your students at all. The only thing you share is your uncertainty, which is just as an egregious violation as the old time priest, rabbi, imam, who only shares their dogmatic certainties. So we need to move into this new moment, this post-postmodern moment, which is a part of the matrix of cosmorotic humanism. This is how we got to a lot of these pieces to actually experience I am true and I hold my uncertainty. Now we, now we have a conversation. Now we have a, the beginning of a universal grammar of value as a context for our diversity. Cha. I like very much this idea that identity as a primary social concern is a failure of the experience of values, which then have paradox like affordances that we can't access. Um, this notion of the kind of certainty that facilitates our ability to encounter and use uncertainty, I think is powerful. And there's a certain sense in which, because we were addressing the problem of evil, that it doesn't come from certainty or uncertainty. It comes from a lack of the experience and the right relating of both of those qualities. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in particular, those qualities in their irreducible form. Now, the question would be, how do we get a better relationship with that irreducible form? Is it to believe in them, whatever that means? Is it to be able to tolerate greater intensities of both certainty or uncertainty? Or what is it that people can do that um, can put them in a better position relative to both certainty and uncertainty? You know, that's a great, that's a great inquiry. Let me, let me share something with you. You know, just literally yesterday, I was talking to a, a close colleague student, and we were in a, a structure in which I have the great privilege to study with people you know, which we call Holy of Holies. So we were in this, you know, Holy of Holies, which is a term we, we borrowed from temple consciousness. And this very wonderful person was sharing that her father, you know, is passing, you know, is, is at this transition point, he's 95. And it's an, it was an incredible moment. Her father asks her just a couple of nights ago at 1.30 in the morning to make some toast and an egg in a particular way. And so she's caring for her father in all the ways that a, a daughter right, cares for her father who's 95 in his transition moment or, or close to that moment. And she makes him this egg and toast and she gives him the egg and they have this moment between them in which she says kind of, you know, in a, a kind of, you know, you know, death humor, you know, don't choke on it. It's a bad way to go. You know, and he laughs and he says, yeah, that, that would be inelegant. And he says, you know, he eats the egg and he says, I want to tell you something that I've never told you. And he relates to her a story when he was two years old in the Great Depression. And they had no money and they, they barely could feed him who was two and his mother. And most of the food had to go to the father so he'd be strong enough to work so everyone wouldn't die, right? And so his mother would make a yolk, an egg yolk with toast, right? And give most of it to the father and just, right? And, and, and he would eat other food. And then he remembered the one time when he was two when the father turned to him and gave him part of the yolk, right? And, and that experience remained embedded, right? This holy moment. And he wanted to transmit, you know, that experience to his daughter, right? So in this moment, is this a little social construction? No, no, no. This is a holy moment. And this is a moment of, there's a radical certainty that she had as she related this to me, that she was, this was, a, this was a moment of the sacred. This was a moment in which the, 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 the moment in which she was escorting her father from, from this life. And he shares with her this esoteric moment of his childhood. And they create this ritual reenactment, right? Of this moment. This is a moment of ultimate certainty of value. It's not a certainty of dogma. It's not a certainty of information. It's a certainty about the irreducible value of that moment, right? And we have to collect those moments in a way and tr we trust our embodied gnosis, our embodied notion, right? That these moments matter, right? And the tragedy of the postmodern moment, you know, one of my favorite books, you know, I, my first degree layman was in, you know, general philosophy and my focus was existentialism. You know, back in the day, I was 18 years old and I, 
I remember reading Sartre's Being a Nothingness, right? It's one of the most stunning books actually ever written, right? And it's actually strange when you read Sartre's Being a Nothingness, the utter certainty of value is so clear as he debunks all value, right? In other words, it's literally as Sartre is saying, you know, the only notion of human freedom and responsibility is to be free from any notion of any kind that I'm part of any field of value. And only then do I face into the nothingness with the utter right, right certainty of realization that the only thing that matters is what I do. And of course, he literally can't hold the performative contradiction in his mind, right? Because he's coming, he's kind of like Rilke in that sense. He's coming out of such an irreducible sense of right, the, the, the certain goodness of life, so that, so even though the, the constructions of his mind can't hold them, right, he's convinced that his embodied experience of them, right, is sufficient, right, whether he's fighting the resistance or he's post-resistance, and, but of course, he can't transmit that. In other words, being a nothingness has a transmission to it, right, but, but no one get today, no one gets the transmission, they just get that Sartre debunked, right, any notion of, intrinsic value, he wasn't able to transmit that, right? Because when you actually deconstruct, right, reverence, because you've deconstructed the field of value, right, even if you as a teacher hold it inside of you, you can't transmit it. It's not transmissible. You, you, you can only transmit it if you're able actually to enact, right, a, a story, right? There have to be stories. We share with stories. We share with, with, with embodied presences. We share with ritual. But if you remove story and you remove ritual, right, and then you remove right the the actual trust in the existence of the field of value itself, so then what happens is right you begin to and I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to who had end life experiences of their parents who actually couldn't hold any sacredness in it, and that's how Camus right you know opens the stranger right mother died today or, or was it yesterday? Right. And it's, it's exactly that inability, right, to hold the certainty, right, of the value of that moment, right, that Camus actually can't do. And Dostoevsky, right, right, you know, Raskolnikov is going to kill the old woman and he's going to find out, oh, was there any value violated? Right. In other words, when we deconstruct the field of value, then we can't actually access our own embodied experience because we're confused. Right. And so we, we need to actually reconstruct a field of value, which is non dogmatic, which is an evolving field of value. That's a whole set of conversations you and I have to have in the future, this new theory of value. But we need to reconstruct the field of value. We need to repave reality with a value which is non dogmatic, but which is intrinsic. Without that, there can't be reverence and there can't be sincerity and, and there can't be genuine curiosity. Right. And, and there can't be devotion. The idea that there's this disjunction between the to the value that Sartre is bringing into something like being a nothingness and the claims he's making about the deconstruction of value, it's very interesting to me because in one way it's like the Tao Da Ching, right, where it's saying, hey, the the values you're looking for cannot be located in language and they cannot be located in the sets of ideas. That's not where they are. So that seems like a very positive move from one angle. And yet, of course, all the things we're doing are talking about ways of restructuring ideas so that they can present these values. So let's see um, if we can bring it together. That's the important, yeah. What do you yeah, let's bring that together. That's really important, okay? Because this is, this is one of the things where, where the Tao Te Ching is, I think, misunderstood, right? And, and the notion, you know, the Tao and the 10,000 things is misunderstood, right? Because... Let me try and let me try and approach it through a different door. Okay, so in the account of the chariot, in you know Western mysticism, in Western esotericism, you know the kind of primary, you know, visual experience. Schwedenborg, right? Everyone writes about it in different ways. Goethe, right? Is the account of the chariot in Ezekiel and Isaiah, and in the account of the chariot, there's what's called the Sod Hachashmal, the secret of the silence, and the Hashmal is Hash. Silence, mal, M A L, mila, word. So the secret of chashmal is called the secret of the speaking silence. And the secret of the speaking silence, which is much what you were referring to as well, right? This notion of this 
but but here this is very very important so just like there's a dialectical dance between certainty and uncertainty and we have to not make the dogmatic move of the prioritization of certainty or uncertainty we also can't make the kind of dogmatic move that often happens in contemporary spiritual circles where we we actually apoth we, we, we live in the apotheosis of the silence right and the paucity of the word Actually, the word and silence are dialectically related to each other. It's very beautiful that in, in Hebrew, the word aleph, right, or the letter, excuse me, aleph as an alpha aleph, the first is silent. Aleph is the silent letter, so aleph is the silence. Keter, the highest illumination, the tree of life. And then that, you know, is keter is shtika, silence. And then beit gimel dalad, the next three letters in the Hebrew alphabet, BCD, so A, aleph, BCD, beit gimel dalad, Beit Gimel has two meanings. One is Bgida, betrayal. So the words betray the silence, one possibility, which, which you're pointing to, and which is real. There's a sense in which words betray silence, and that's obviously real. And there's a second meaning of Beget, which is clothing, garb. Words garb the silence. You know, what is the, what is the, what is the poet trying to do? The poet is trying to stretch words to their breaking point until you can feel the silence that infuses the words, right? And so, so this sharp split between words and silence is actually inaccurate, right? There's a speaking silence and there are words that emerge out of the silence. And, and Layman, I think both of us, right? You can actually feel both when we're speaking ourselves and when we speak to someone who's a genuine interlocutor, you can literally feel in your body the distinction between a person who is speaking from the silence, right, which is kind of, it emerges from a kind of silence of presence, which then yields the word, or a person who is, or ourselves, who are speaking to cover up the silence. And, and so again, the sharp split, and I know in Eastern texts, the split is made very sharp. It exists in Kabbalah and Western esotericism as, as well. But I think in our post-postmodern understanding, right? And, you know, in cosmorotic humanism, we want to actually hold the relationship of the word to the silence as being dialectical, as being paradoxical, as opposed to, right, splitting off one or the other. And I think that begins to take us home. Yeah. Mm. Much uncertainty at the core experience of the self, do we have to risk in order to encounter an unforced non-pseudo certainty in the core of the self? Like is uncertainty the pathway to encountering that certainty? That's, that's, that is a very, 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 you know, beautiful question, right? And I'm using the word beautiful again and again, because they're all beautiful. They're not just true and good. They're, they're beautiful questions. There's an elegance to them. And, and, one of the primary and already implicit in your framing of the question, right, is I wouldn't call it the answer, but a response. And we have to distinguish always between answers and responses. Answers cancel questions. Responses address questions, engage questions, right? And so to respond right to your question, one of the most beautiful methods at coming to certainty is to stretch the uncertainty as far as you can. And that's to utterly refuse to adopt a false certainty, right? There's a, um, and I won't mention his name because I don't have permission, but, but another very, very close dear friend that I've been studying with for 12 years in, in this Holy of Holies structure. And, you know, this person, a wonderful human being, um, her husband recently passed and he was a brilliant, you know, physicist who who refused to adopt any spiritual model of any kind, right? And, you know, his, his wife, who's a, also, a, you know, a learned and, you know, discerning and, and very brilliant educator for the last 40 years, you know, we were talking once in Holy of Holies and, and she articulated, and we did together, this notion that he had made a kind of prior contract before his birth, not to buy into any false certainties. But that was actually his journey in this lifetime was to refuse to actually adopt any false certainties. And Cook, Abraham Cook, who is, is an incredibly important 
realizer, kind of a, a Hebrew wisdom arabindo, although in a very different sense, Cook has this beautiful phrase in a book called The Lights of Trust, Orota Amuna, right? In um, subsection, I think, 25, where he says, Yesh emunashi kfira o kfira emuna. There's heresy, which is faith, and faith, which is heresy, which is so incredibly beautiful, right? In other words, faith, which is heresy, is the belief in small certainties. That's when we buy into certainties, right? Because we can't bear right, to actually sit in the uncertainty, right? So we, we have this, this, this faith, but our faith is actually heresy, and it's actually a small certainty. It's a, a small comprehension. And then there's heresy, which is faith, meaning we reject the small certainties, right, because we actually understand that there's something deeper and there's something wider and there's something more good and more true and more beautiful that we can only get to, as you imply, right, to a radical refusal right, to worship at the idolatry of false certainties, right? And that's really what idolatry is. If you think about what idolatry is, idolatry is a graven image. And a graven image, right, in English is a freezing of the imagination. And the imagination is the willingness to enter into the curiosity of uncertainty and imagine new possibilities in the human being as Adam Adam, who includes both Adam and Eve in the original text. And Adam is human or humus. So Adam is Adama, ground, humus, earth. But Adam also means in the original Hebrew, dimayon, which means imagination. So the human being is homo imaginus. The human being is homo imaginus. And to be homo imaginus, I have to be willing to step out of the certainties, right? And step into the, the possibility of possibility, right? Which is, the willingness to embrace the uncertainty. And only from there can I arrive at a kind of a moment, right, of my, my core certainty of being, right? And, and then, I, then I let it go again. And then I embrace the uncertainty again. And then I, I step into another moment. And it's that movement, right, that psychological movement, that, that, that inner movement, that transformative movement, w- which is the, the movement of the new human and the new humanity. And it's not pre-modernity, it's not modernity, it's not post-modernity. It's actually, it's actually this new emergence that we can actually live in. Cha. Do the Old and New Testaments draw different mm-hmm. conclusions about the relationship between certainty and uncertainty? They, they do indeed, my friend. Right? They do indeed. And they're, they're, they're both misread. I, I'll share with you a moment. Back to anecdote. So... In, in their, their popular readings, they're thought to be the same, right? You know, um, particularly the New Testament obviously is deeply related to faith, but actually so is the Old Testament. You know, a classical verse of it, Sadiq Bamunato Yifya, the righteous lives by his faith. So faith is a major construct in both, but it's actually fundamentally misunderstood. So I'm going to relate to an anecdotal moment. When I say misunderstood, I want to say what I mean by that. I don't mean that I'm about to kind of foist some postmodern or contrived interpretation on a text, right? That would, that would revolt my body, right? In other words, I would, and it would be a violation of the integrity of the text and and the texts can admit many possibilities, but they don't admit infinite possibilities. And the texts are read so incredibly superficially, generally by, by readers of secondary sources or by orthodox interpreters of the text who ignore whole swaths of text. So I'll give you an example, which I hope will address your, your inquiry directly. So there's a gentleman named Akiva Tatz. And Akiva, if you're listening, I say this with great love. And so Akiva was giving a talk. He's a very, very popular um, Dr. Akiva Tatz lecture, you know, on kind of Hebrew wisdom. And he says, and he writes this in, in one of his books, he says, biblical man does not have an experience of uncertainty, right? That's a later experience. Right? The experience of uncertainty of, of kind of maybe, that's, that's not an experience of biblical man. And he points out the word safek, S-A-F-E-K, safek doesn't actually exist in the biblical text. So first, safek is a etymologically a later word from later languages. That's why it doesn't exist in the biblical text. But two, and this is far more important, right? There's a primary word in the book of Genesis, which is ulai. And Ulai is maybe. And I was ecstatic when I was about 30 and in that six month period that we talked about in the beginning to actually notice this genre of text in the book of Genesis, seven different stories, 
which are the seven key Genesis stories in which the pivoting point, Roki's phrase, the pivotal word is ulai, maybe, right? So like the famous Jacob wrestling with the angel, chapter 32, right? Maybe is the key word ulai, right? Ulai is always the key word. Ulai means maybe, I'm not sure, uncertainty. And the Zohar, right, 13th century actually says, shechinta ikreit ulai, the shechina. She, right, the, the 10th illumination, Malchut, right, right, the, the goddess herself, her name is maybe, her name is uncertainty. Right? And so, so actually in the biblical text, there's this very strong subtext of uncertainty that got intentionally read out of the story, right, by the orthodoxies, both within Judaism and within Christianity. And the moment of uncertainty, the moment of Jesus saying on the cross, not forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do, but actually saying, Eli, Eli, lama zaftani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? You know, the, Jesus is 40 days in the desert and the blackness, that, that's written out of the story. And it becomes a faith construct. But, but, but actually, you know, Jacob in that night says maybe in chapter 32 when he wrestles with the angel and the very word Israel means to wrestle. Right. So, so to be an Israelite, whether you're Jewish or Christian or Muslim or agnostic, to be an Israelite is to be a God wrestler. And it's to wrestle with the uncertainty. And, and remember Tolstoy in his essay on art, he says, to struggle is to embrace. Right? And that's the act of wrestling, the act of embracing, right? Making love, right? And struggling, wrestling with the divine are actually intimately and inextricably related. Through my body, I vision God. God wrestling and the goddess of maybe would be the good title for something. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have another curiosity around remorse. I'm really intrigued by remorse as a catalyst for moral and ethical developmental intelligence, because we, mm. we have to be able to look back at our actions, even if they initially struck us as righteous and decide that they might be below the level of our current values and insights. And then yeah, we yeah. might have to, go you know, a purifying inner contradiction, which is a form of an uncertainty. Yeah. How do we, um, from your point of view, how do we make use of the errors of our past certainties to make us better, deeper, more humane, more divine beings going forward? That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So, so in order to do that, we need a construct that's not available today in either Western or Eastern consciousness. We need to introduce something into the matrix, which is actually utterly core. And without it, I don't think we can actually appropriately do remorse. And a person who doesn't have remorse isn't trustable, right? And it's remorse is, is a core human experience. Remorse shouldn't be remorse that locks us in depression, but it should be a, a constructive catalytic moment for transformation. But we can't afford remorse without being able to access our possibility of transformation. And so let me see if I can just play with that for a second. In, in kind of the classical notions of time, in which time is understood to be linear, and particularly in kind of the way the Western notion of time, in which, you know, kind of the, the myth of eternal return is kind of bisected by the biblical line, it's in which time moves forward in its classical way. So if I fucked up yesterday, pardon my French, right? If I made a, a tragic mistake yesterday and today's today, there's nothing I can do to undo it, right? Because time's moving forward and, and I can never get back to that moment in time. So I can regret it. I can try and make amends, but that's all I can do. There's a very core moment in the lineages of Hebrew wisdom, which is called Teshuvah. T-E-S-H-U-V-A. And I think we literally can't enact a society without this idea. And teshuvah means that time is both linear and we need to take time seriously as a, as a linear movement. Uh, but actually time is also cyclical, right? There's also a circle in time, which of course makes sense. In other words, these are two core intuitions of human consciousness, right? the cyclical notion and this linear notion. And of course, they try and exclude each other, just like certainty and uncertainty, but it's unlikely, right? They're actually more in paradoxical relationship. And actually, there's a way to actually experience the cycle of time in which you actually realize 
that you actually come back again to the same dynamic, right? So it's not just that there's seasons, right, which are cyclical, but actually in the interior world, right, all my life's a circle, right? Harry Chapin, right? Sunrise and sundown, right? And that's time comes around again. I come back to the same dynamic. I come back to that same construct. I come back to that same quality, that same quality of intimacy, that same quality of relationship. And so Teshuvah means as follows. Teshuvah means I made a mistake. I have remorse, number one, step one. This is Maimonides, right? Maimonides, right, says Teshuvah, I made a mistake. So A, A says, number one, I recognize the mistake, recognition. Two, Charata, I have genuine remorse. Three, I realize that that moment's going to come around again. And I commit that when that moment comes around again, I'll engage it differently. Now, even before the moment comes around again, right, just those three steps are understood in the interior sciences, that reconfiguring of your internal eros, right, through those three steps, when you take them seriously, genuine recognition, meaning not maybe, could be, but I really did it because, no, no, just unmitigated, clear, fierce, uncompromising recognition, wow, I fucked up. Right? No, you know, David, when Nathan the prophet comes to him, David says, Khatati, I sinned, I made a mistake, period. Right? So, A, A, clear recognition, I made a mistake. Two, a genuine sense of remorse. And three, right, a commitment to, in the same dynamic, engage it differently. Right? So, in the lineage, right, that reconfiguration of one's eros takes one quite literally beneath the space time continuum. Now, the notion that we can get beneath the space-time continuum is actually quite, quite important in physics now. I mean, there's a book that kind of made the rounds in circles that we're both maybe adjacent to, um, a book by Donald Hoffman called The Case Against Reality, which I assume you ran into. And, you know, Donald had a very good set of footnotes that I went and followed, right, um, and read a whole bunch of his footnotes, which were about the notion in physics that the space-time continuum is dead, that there's actually a notion you know, in mathematics of kind of getting beneath the space-time continuum. So this notion of teshuvah operates on the notion that if I actually go through this reconfiguration of my eros, I actually get underneath the space-time continuum. And although I have to deal and make amends for the effect of what I did in the world, but in terms of my own character, I actually reclaim my second innocence, meaning I reclaim the certainty of my being. I actually reclaim my goodness. Now, if that possibility doesn't exist for a human being, so then we're stuck in the utter tragedy of human beings who are fallible and who make mistakes and, and who fuck up, right? And, 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 and are, have no way to actually step out and back into their own innocence. So we've got to have three, three, three structure stages of consciousness. Innocence, which is pretty tragic. Guilt, tragic. And then second innocence, which is post-tragic. But you can't get to second innocence unless you go through a genuine process of transformation, which at least in one methodology of the lineage is these three steps I just described. There's obviously different ways to tell that story. But the key to the story is there's a way to get back to second innocence, right? And without that, which means there's a way to get back to my core certainty of being. So once I do that, I don't need to defend, right, right my position as a form of pseudo-erotic certainty, I can actually hold, right, the possibility that, wow, I made a mistake. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I made a mistake, right? And, and we can actually, we can actually engage that and transform. Without that, there's no possibility of transformation. So that, that's, that, that, that's critical. And again, it's certainty and uncertainty and play again. And it's their dialectical relationship, which just changes everything. It just changes everything. Cha. This is a little bit uh, tangential, but since we talked about certainty and uncertainty in the Old and New Testament, which is a little bit like saying the Jewish and the Christian take, uh, I saw you and Zach and Alexander Bard, hosted by my friends at the Parallax Academy, having a discussion. And Alexander Bard is our go-to guy for Zoroastrianism these days. Yes, yes. I, I wonder if you have a take on the Zoroastrian resolution or approach to the problem of certainty and uncertainty. No, I don't, right? And as I, in other words, I'm, I'm familiar with, it's a great question, I'm familiar with Zoroastrianism, but not through its primary sources. In other words, Zoroastrianism, the, the lineage sources of Hebrew wisdom were in response 
right? There's a whole strain, which is in response to Zoroastrianism, right? And to kind of the notion of the demiorgus and the kind of split or the rejection of this world as being, you know, the realm of impurity and the need to kind of move beyond this world. But, but my, my knowing of Zoroastrianism is secondary and not primary. And so though, although I could say 20 things about it, I don't feel certain enough in my body, right? To actually have an embodied intuition and actually Alexander and I should actually have that. We promised each other we would, we should have a full, a full Hebraic, you know, Zoroastrian conversation where we actually listen deeply to each other and learn from each other. That's a, that, that's actually on the agenda. So, so thank you. But no, I, I can't respond to that, you know, with sufficient intelligence. But, but here's also a good moment, right? Uncertainty, right? It's very easy to, right? If I'm in the core certainty of my being, it's very easy not to answer a question. And I don't need to create a full certainty. It's like, oh, right, okay, that's, that's an open one. Let's go fill that in, right? And there's, there's a graciousness to that, right? Which, which makes us trustful to each other. Curious about the relationship of certainty and uncertainty to justice. Yeah. Uh, very often, justice has been proposed as a way of counterbalancing things about which we are certain. And yet many of the issues around justice are pointing to the fact that we're not certain. Like the death penalty is not a great punishment because of how often we're wrong about who's actually committed a crime, other factors aside. So what are the... You know, what are the consequences of the way you conceive certainty and uncertainty in terms of righteous social organization? Yeah. So, yeah, you know, there's a beautiful phrase in the Talmud in uh, Tractate Ta'anit 4a, and the phrase is Reticha de Oraita, which is the, the prophetic outrage against injustice. And there's a certainty to that. Right. And there, there's a moment I had a, a discussion with a, a friend, a dear friend, John, who was the board chair of the center for quite a while. And we were talking about outrageous love. Right. And John said, let's call it unlimited love. And I said, John, what does that do for you and your body? Unlimited love. Right. And he laughed and he said, but, but in, in outrageous love, you have the notion of rage. And I said, well, precisely. Right. Rage, right. In its shadow form is a narcissistic idolatry right? And idolatry or reification of the narcissistic self, but rage in its, its clarified form, right, is the prophetic rage against injustice, which requires, right, an assertion of certainty. And we don't need to shirk prophetic outrage, right? We need to be outraged, right, at redlining, and we need to be outraged, right, at false accusations, and we need to be outraged at rape, and we need to be outraged at male rape in prison, right? More men are being raped, right, in prisons today in America, right, than, I mean, any other category of people, right? In other words, these things are outrageous. We need to be outraged that there's 40 million people in the country that don't have health insurance, right? And that there's something in capitalism that's actually broken down when you have millions and millions of people who can get cancer and know that they'll have no way to live. Right? I mean, in other words, in other words, we just keep going on and, and we lose kind of the certainty of outrage, right? And so we need, to, we need to get outraged and we need to kind of hold that certainty, right? Which is that justice is real, you know? And I, I want to share with you something. And again, you evoke it and I appreciate it. You know, I was talking to a, a dear friend who, who I won't name, who's a, you know, a, a very wonderful human being and a you know, a leading intellectual in, in his field, you know, kind of the most published and, you know, acclaimed. And we study together once a week. Um, and he's kind of, you know, um, and we just get together and study text together, you know, Aramaic text, because because that's what we do, right? And, you know, he's kind of um, kind of classical in the field, and I'm kind of the ultimate, you know, renegade maverick in the field, but we're both blessed to be, you know, good readers of texts. And so I, I came to him a decade ago, you know, outraged at a certain injustice that I'd experienced, right? And he said to me, he said, he said, Mordechai, it's my Hebrew name. He said, we're post-Holocaust Jews. We don't believe in justice. And I said, and I was about to say his name. I said his name, whatever his name. And I said, stop, like, stop. You've just allowed post-modernity to redefine at the lineage that we're both studying, right? I mean, the notion that we, that we're, we don't believe in justice. And you had this postmodern infusion, 
right, into the very center of the thinking of, of, of a quite a good thinker, right, in this field. And we do believe in justice. Now, do we need epistemic humility, right, and how we approach, right, the, the dispersal of justice we do? Absolutely. You know, my, my colleague, I haven't spoken to in, in many years, a beautiful man. We just haven't been in the same, in the same room. But, you know, Michael Zimmerman was actually Diane's husband, Diane Hamilton's husband, you know, and, and Michael was the chief justice in Utah. And Michael said, you know, the amount of times it goes wrong in court, right? And that's the notion that because the court decided one way that actually mirrors the truth is certainly often the truth, but it's just as often not. And there's a thousand reasons why a judge can make a decision and why things can go in a particular way, which is why he said, you never want to actually be in court because you're already fundamentally vulnerable because you're in, you're in a realm in which there's so many multifactorial you know, issues at play. And so the notion that, that the court system yields justice and that that's a form of certainty which allows us to adjudicate reality right, is, is a complete epistemic fantasy. And so we actually need the humility of uncertainty right, to actually be able to, to actually get to the deepest sense of justice. And yet at the same time, we need the outrage against injustice, right? We need to move beyond that kind of jaded cynicism. And we, we need to actually, right, access this prophetic outrage. And, you know, you know I, I don't actually understand how in the United States we can actually bear the possibility, right, for decades tens and tens and tens of million people literally not having health insurance. Like, how do we bear that? And, and so it's actually a depression, right, of, of prophetic outrage, right? It's a violation, right, of that certainty that should live in us, which should be a simple, unmediated instinct. But instead, you know, we mediate, we mediate it through libertarianism. And it's, we have all sorts of, you know, kind of very sophisticated philosophies that allow us to lose connection to that core certainty of being, right? It, it's a violation that someone should be diseased and not be able to heal, right? Simply because they don't have access to funds. And so again, here again, right? It's so beautiful. We note that only a dialectical, dialectical dance, not intellectually, but in my core experience between uncertainty as a value and core certainty of being allow me to get to either ethos or eros. Like that. There are... Um... There are a lot of other little pieces from these books that have intrigued me that I was thinking maybe I would ask about Jacob's crookedness and disambiguating yeah. the divine voice and the role of sacrifice. But I feel like this is a, a pretty good chunk of time we've put in now. Yes. We might want to bring this first uh, installment of the journey to cosmoerotic humanism to an end. So thank you, Mark, for being here, for your time and for your excitement on these uh, often arcane topics. And thank you for your, your wonderful inquiry and, and the delight of this dialogue. I was totally appreciated and delighted. Thank you. Thank you.